Morning, Adil. Good morning, three. What are you doing today? Yeah, very well. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for asking. Yep. Thanks, uh, Kun, and thanks, uh, Penisha, for joining. Our session starts at 11 today, right? That is at 11 a.m. today. Morning, Sri. How are you? Very well, very well, very well. So, bit of a shop talking after all. It's all automatic yeah, other than it's fun. And the thing is, our meeting with <coughs> Alexis tomorrow. Maybe give, give them two more minutes. We are starting a session with slightly a different uh, uh, change agenda. So, um, I believe I can take the privilege and uh, pleasure to do that. Is uh, we talked all about ITWIN, ITIN implementation, and then Ron took you through a couple of commercial implementation sites on. But this is very relevant to me because it our efforts are not only for the commercial one where they pay the dollar to do it. We also work extensively with academic institution where it's all about creating that eye twin knowledge and then allowing students to go on a work integrated learning project of hands on working on eye twin platform or digital twin. So of course, Dr. Mustafa is a home man, so he has already done one digital twin project on along with the Aravali water. Uh, so I thought I will bring one more flavor where Bentley has extensively teamed up with um, Griffith University in in Queensland, and a couple of years ago we built a complete digital and spatial technology curriculum, incorporating a full life cycle of linear infrastructure, starting from concept design to road design to bridge design to building design to uh, though it is linear, building building is coming across in the linear though it is linear because they didn't want to miss out uh, that as well, and then and then to project management and visualization and. Dr. Cheryl Desha, who is the director for industry engagement, and who is also a professor there on spatial technology. And uh, her cupboard has more than half a dozen hats. She keeps changing on. So one, one of the hats is that it's both sustainability and and uh, um, and uh, uh, sustainable construction, sustainable built environment. And she is in the UNO committee for the sustainable development goal, 2030 goal. So. We worked along with that team, and Irfan will also were, was involved. Is converting a one of the official building. The building what you see at the backdrop of um, uh, Cheryl. Hello, good morning, Cheryl. Is a building called N79 in in Nathan Campus. That has been completely converted into a digital twin. And uh, I think I will shut up there. And Cheryl, it's all yours. Thank you, Shri. I'm just looking at who's online. Adil, Athene, Sandani, Kinzel, Majaba. Great to see you all, Panusha. Uh, Irfan, uh, you also have the opportunity to be online. I wonder, wonder whether you could show your face and just say hello for this morning um, as I get started. And I will share my screen. Uh, so it's wonderful to be with you all. I think, uh, you know, the, the we actually have an existing uh, relationship with RMIT on quite a number of levels. I think RMIT and Griffith um, have uh, a really great similar philosophical base in the work that we do and the collaborations that we undertake. So actually I'm down here um, because of the CIB conference that was held last week. And um, that conference is construction management, construction innovation. Uh, and I think um, is close to home in terms of the um, aspirations of that community to create uh, digital interfaces for managing their infrastructure and they were there's lots of conversation about the challenges and um, uh, intensive um, resourcing environments around digital twins and listening to that was quite interesting to think about where we could go from here in leaning out that process not only for our industry partners as they grapple with uh, managing built infrastructure uh, in in the face of you know quite extreme weather events and events and changing environmental circumstances, but also for uh, academic colleagues in being able to that's being generated uh, in real time, uh, near real time, and also in um, in retrospect to uh, provide some supporting evidence base for future planning. So you know when we look at the experience of infrastructure. 
uh, in high wind load events or during fire, uh, flood, and uh, being able to look back at that data and do some forward planning with our decision makers around the re reliability of that infrastructure going forward, uh, whether it needs to be decommissioned, whether it needs to be strengthened, and then running scenarios. I think that's that's in our um, in our future. Uh, lived experiences, academics working with our industry and government colleagues in doing that strategic thinking and strategic planning. So my personal journey has been in um, in this building in N79, uh, affectionately called. They're numbered chronologically, so uh, you might see out in the um, in the world at the moment we're already on to N82 on the same campus, which uh, we are hoping will have a similar data intelligence about it uh, as we learn lessons from this one. My um, current interest area you can uh, find out through the Griffith Experts page there is around disaster resilience. So after having spent near two decades in looking at sustainable development around the sustainable development goals, um, being in the lived reality of a lot of disasters hitting Queensland around floods and fires, especially over the last five years, uh, and thinking about how we deal with infrastructure resilience, resilient infrastructure in the face of ongoing adversity um, is, is a challenging and um, interesting journey for me and keeps my curiosity up. So uh, if keep that in mind as we go through this process. So as I landed at Griffith um, back in 2016, so I do have a past in Griffith as well, um, but we, um, the university decided to put this building in on Nathan campus, which is in Brisbane, just south of the city centre, about 10 minutes um, south on the highway, off to the right. Uh, and as I uh, rejoined the university and said about this uh, particular project, we had the opportunity to put in quite a number of sensors that would enable us for the first time at Griffith to really have a detailed understanding of one building's performance. And so um, it, it was completed to 2019. Uh, and then the last, of course, we had COVID for a couple of years in between, so it has stalled our journey a little bit in terms of getting that digital twin active. I just wanted to share a few of the things that we've done inside that process, that journey. Um, and the reality is we're still on our way very much um, inside the journey. So, you know, looking ahead at how, um, how we can work with Bentley to get a completed product that we can then share with our community students and, and staff and industry partner partners. So, uh, of course, you know, from woe to go, uh, we were looking at why we needed the data in the first place, and I've just explained that context for you. So then the type of sensors, what we wanted to capture, how we were going to manage that. Griffith has quite an extensive historian ISOS um, software platform that they we use across our five campuses. And then uh, what, what this green box mean? What does it mean to develop a digital twin to then support our um, curiosity and our investigations for that building going forward? And how do we bring that into the curriculum so that we're enabling our students and our academics actually to learn how to learn with software. So becoming more agile in picking up different pieces of um, technology and working with it with a healthy understanding of the limitations and opportunities of that software. So it really uh, did come from a teaching and learning context as well as the research context uh, and that yellow line in having a sensor system that shows real time and historical data uh, for us is really important. And I really appreciated um, Ron and Dave's uh, commentary yesterday, particularly Dave's around the uh, differences between a BIM um, point in time platform and, and that lived real time experience that you get uh, with a with a digital twin environment. So for us, um, part of the challenge and opportunity has actually been getting this uh, collaboration and external uh, engagement happening over the years. And I'm happy to talk more about that if people have questions about um, how and who we've engaged with. Um, the, for us, as we've said, the, it's around um, ensuring that the sensors tell a story that we can then create meaningful information about. So for us, that was subsurface and surface. And I'll just go through some images to give you a bit of an idea of what we did. And then this augmented reality slash virtual reality project around seeing um, uh, seeing the building from different perspectives and students relating to that technology to understand how the building performs. So these are the um, 
we had about 150,000 in grants to put in um, these uh, sensors. So uh, we had Pesometers outside in terms of groundwater and the observation wells, um, earth pressure cell sensors um, underground, and um, and then stress strain gauges in building. So had a bit of fun in actually getting them in. I think this part of the story is not often told, but if you don't get the sensors right in the beginning, <laughs> then you haven't got much to work with. So in, in meaningful information in, meaningful information out. So these were our um, pesometer locations and then um, the accelerometer installation and some really good lessons learned there just in getting that um, data intelligence set up properly um, during construction is so much easier than post construction. So we've learned some lessons for N82 as that journey continues. Uh, the, if you've know, got information there, I can share after if you're interested about what we did. So this is the, um, the the levels of the building in terms of what we've put in and having that clarity of mind then um, being able to, at least in a two-dimensional format here, as you can see with the drawings, being able to lay that out for our, our contractors for install. We didn't actually use a 3D model during the um, from the design construction phase, which is a bit disappointing for me. I thought we would inside the tendering documents. It did have that. But it's one of the examples, I think, of where things can fall over between architect and contractor to actually use um, a 3D modelled environment to enable the construction versus going back to reams and reams of two-dimensional um, drawings. So um, the, we have had a student project, a couple of student projects in looking at a dashboard of how to now interpret that um, information. And I think, Shree, that's given us an appreciation of um, life before digital twin, if I can put it like that. So I think it'll be really interesting for us to compare and contrast what happens in a um, in an iTwin environment. Uh, we do have some PhDs scoped out for that journey and it's a case of getting them funded now. So very keen to take that forward. And maybe there's some collaboration opportunities with our RMIT colleagues, um, you know, borrowing inside and outside of institution to find experts who are interested in, um, in taking the journey from here with us um, to see how we can have a more interactive uh, uh, environment to play with. So for our student project, um, this was a summary of what the student was getting up to. And I'm an environmental engineer, so I'm borrowing some slides here around the software um, journey. But David Rowlands is happy happy to talk to people if you've got questions about it. And from a you know very um, rudimentary level, how the student went about uh, conceptualizing what information we needed and how often and the time um, increments of data capture and then visualization. So I think in the digital twin story, it's as much about understanding these types of fundamental questions in ensuring that there's meaningful information in and out um, as it is in then um, portraying it. So the ARVR project uh, really did stop with COVID uh, in terms of the data capture um, on the floors. And as things happen in terms of building commissioning and budgets expiring, uh, we, we still need to get this one finished uh, in terms of the indoor um, space capture. Uh, externally, our building sits very close to an airport. So uh, we I understand we do have CASA clearance after a year of going through the approvals processes to be able to do a drone fly around uh, the building to, to get that um, full external uh, context capture kind of environment sorted uh, to then marry with this internal space. And we do have one PhD student at the moment looking at the um, energy modelling of building with some um, internal visuals uh, through uh, Yasemin, uh, her project that um, she's getting towards second year now, which is great to be able to then use her um, knowledge and skills going forward. So Shree mentioned that we have a course that we developed back in uh, 2020 and then uh, iterated last year, uh, where we have about 20 to 30 students graduating each trimester. And that one has includes open building, but it's open roads, open building, open bridge, uh, and then a little bit of context capture, Synchro Pro and Luminati uh, embedded in that one course, 12 week course. And I think from there, it's not a prerequisite for other learning, but it does provide us with a focal point for students to uh, learn about the Bentley software suite. And then our plan is that we actually take the data um, that's coming from those uh, sensors, 30 plus sensors in building, and actually embed them into these courses in our program. 
So this is the next, you know, um, big, hairy, audacious goal for us going forward is that in a digital twin environment, we would love to be able to do this kind of cur curriculum integration. And we're not there yet, but that's that's the, uh, the, the goal going forward. So, Shri, I hope that provides a good context of our um, our learning journey. I uh, happy happy to share it quite um, openly with our colleagues uh, via this platform because I think it really does take a community of practice to push through some of the challenges we experience in academia around going from oh that's a nice idea to actually having this kind of building. Um, uh, created into a digital twin with that learning uh, with the journey documented so that others can do it more um, more efficiently. And it's been an exciting journey there and I have one question from Ron. So the question is, is there any feedback into the building design with Hazel or CPB regarding the knowledge gained from having sensors on the building? For an example, the recent Brisbane earthquake, mm. did the sensor pick up any data and that would be shared back with the designers? Yeah, that great question, uh, Ron. And uh, we have, uh, we haven't, I think, the short answer is we haven't yet, and the, actually the Brisbane earthquake data, a blind spot for me because I was down, coming down here at the time, I think it was the week before, and of course um, haven't gone and looked at the data to see what the building did. Excellent point. Um, I will, uh, Irf and we can make a note of that in terms of an IAP project. I think Dominic can get straight onto it in terms of what the subsurface sensors may have picked up. Um, Certainly, we've been having conversations with um, with Hassel last year, and not so much CPB, but the structural engineers Bornhoff, uh, Born, never say their name properly, Bornhoff, uh, and Ward. They um, they are interested in the sensor story, and it's for us. It's a matter of getting it into a suitable format for them. So the dashboard was part of that um, that attempt last year. Uh, we do have um, a colleague inside our facilities management team, Brian Hobie, who is exceptional at visualising information and has our five campuses, mechanical air conditioning systems and other systems very well um, documented. I was just talking with him, we had the Building Association of Australia visit for a tour the week before last, and he was showing uh, his latest dashboarding of um, of the, our existing sensors in N79, and they look like they're coming through very clearly. So it is something. It is one of the to do list items is to get back to Bornhoff and Ward and have a workshop on um, what they what they would be interested in seeing from that data. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Ron. And one of the prime objectives, Ron, on this was about yeah, data is important, but then to take the student through, you know, from the concept stage of telling them about what digital twin is, training them about why digital twin i twin is important, and then allowing them to do a data capture using context capture, the best practices methodology. So they go through the whole life cycle of that. So at the end of the day, say they are actually working on and work integrated learning on this rather than just just learning on the theory of that. So. Uh, and we are possibly planning to go to the next level of involving ICT team, that is the uh, that is the you know students who are in the information technology to collect this data to start building a dashboard, and then uh, we have a plan that we will run the same kind of workshop what we are doing for RMD here for uh, for Griffith run over a period mm -hmm. of time. So mm -hmm. and uh, you know let's see how we can work on that. So, yeah, yeah sure. I think it would be great. It would be great, Shri. Imagine um, if we can um, emulate this environment through the RMIT workshop and perhaps focus in on some of the aspects of N79 and actually use the this environment to um, have a play with some of the data. That would be that would be excellent as a, yeah. a next step. Great. That, that should be the next step. Thank, thank you, you so much, Shri. Thank, Cheers. Thank, thank you. Appreciate it. To you sharing the experience and Dr. Mustafa, I'm going to just suddenly, you know, kind of uh, without without any notice, I'm going to drop you onto a surprise uh, box. And Mustafa, very quickly, sir, can you share your experience about digital twin in the water leakage project? I mean, briefly, no presentation needed, just a talk through about how what, what is the learning process, how the you know capstone projects work on. Is that, is that all right, Dr. Mustafa? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Uh... Uh, just a brief uh, explanation about what uh, we have done or and we are doing. Uh, we started last year uh, with Bentley using uh, 
open below water gems and uh, by twin platform uh, for uh, water leakage prediction in uh, water pipe networks. And we had Yarrow Valley Water as a uh, as a partner who provide us uh, sensor data. They've got uh, pressure meter and digital meter in one of their suburbs installed. They've got this data. They had their uh, own uh, procedure for leakage detection, uh, but we thought uh, using uh, open flow water gems, uh, we will be able to predict the leakage location more accurately. So we started this uh, through a couple of capstone projects in good support from Berkeley. Uh, student uh, benefited from some workshops to learn how to work with uh, water gems and then uh, Darwin calibrator, other uh, SCADA and other uh, stuff that we need to integrate for having a digital twin. Uh, and yeah, they work through it uh, at first instance. Uh, they work with uh, uh, offline data. So we had data, uh, sensor data offline, and uh, they use as input uh, the uh, model uh, to, to predict the uh, leakage location. And this year, uh, what we are trying to do is to uh, solve the challenge of connectivity of online data to as input to the to water gem system or to, to, to this digital twin. Uh, I think iTwin is capable of doing this. Uh, we have a bit of uh, uh, challenge with uh, the water authority. They to have access to the live data is, is a bit challenging, but uh, yeah, if we solve this, then we will be able to have a real time mm -hmm. hydraulic model of the of this water pipe network. And then in real time, we can do all the analysis and predict the location of leakage. And the next step for us is to as a research body is to work on some artificial intelligence algorithms to make uh, this digital thing more accurate. Not, not to find or detect the leakage location. We also able to predict for future how many leakages and potentially in which location, for example, in the next five years we might have. So that's where we need to develop uh, artificial neural networks and uh, uh, feed in the historical data when this digital twin works for a few months or a couple of years, then is a good uh, uh, database there which can be used to train those uh, ANN algorithms and then uh, add this uh, predictivity function to this digital twin. So that's our next step, step actually. Yep. Sure. Um, thank you, Dr. Mufasar. You know, um, 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 apologies for, you know, suddenly dropping you onto the limelight, uh, but uh, I think yeah. the project, what you worked on with Yara Valley, it deserves a lot more than a limelight. Maybe, uh, you know, it should have been spoken from the center of the MCG. So great. Thank you, sir. And the, the whole process of engagement for Bentley Education was that as um, under the leadership of Dr. Mufasar's team, we, the, the, the students went through a complete hands-on training on our water network product, uh, what you talked about water gems, and then they learned about how to take historical data, how to massage it, how to load it on, and then how do I connect the SCADA data? So next level will be the next level will be possibly the analysis and dashboard, and then uh, what you call machine learning. So, and uh, this is not the only one with uh, Dr. Mustafa. We are also working on a couple of uh, CRC funded projects on using digital twin for predictive maintenance uh, of uh, assets. Uh, one of them is Darling Pool Port, and second one is a you know constructed bridge. So Bentley Education is more than will be more than happy to work with any one of you on this. Any resources that are needed, I think these are the two professors who are who will profess for this. So uh, uh, I thought I will just give you an, give you an introduction there onto that. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa, and thank you, Professor Sharif. Appreciate that. And uh, I think we are at 11. Uh, 
and I see doc, uh, uh, Dr. Franz Richung signed joined in. Thank you, Dr. Franz. I mean, uh, I wanted you to be part of this anyway. So, Ron, stage is yours, Matt. Wow, I'm not sure I can follow up with that one. That was that was pretty good. I like I like real world stuff. Uh, that's uh, I get to live in fantasy land a bit too long, I think. But um, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Thanks. There is, there, is, there is a fair bit of work, uh, both uh, Griffith and uh, RMIT, particularly Dr. Mustafa, really, you know, arm, what do you call it, uh, twisting the arm of Pytwin to get the best out of it. And Dr. Mustafa's special area is, is asset health management, specifically from uh, taking it from, from, you know, breakdown maintenance to predictive maintenance using a, of a built environment. So, uh, and uh, there, are some, there are some exceptional research work that are going on. Uh, uh, where Bentley's Bentley Education and Bentley System is participating as a in-kind for uh, one of the couple of uh, couple of the projects. So, Ron, we will lead back on you for more. Yeah, no worries. Happy to happy to help wherever I can. Sounds great. Thank you. It's all yours now. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Welcome back uh, to uh, some iTwin platform discussion uh, this morning. So uh, today's session, we're going to have a look at not so much programming as we were yesterday, but more of a look of what's available to you as part of the, the platform itself. Uh, so this morning, we'll, we'll go through uh, some other tools and things that are up your sleeve when you use the, the uh, Bentley iTwin platform in there as well. So yesterday, we pretty much spent uh, the afternoon looking at the visualizer, uh, being able to look at the 3D model, uh, being able to... Uh, to work with that visualizer, add some code in there, add some widgets and stuff. There's uh, a ton of examples that, that center around that. We've got a, uh, example SDKs for mobile devices as well in, in GitHub. Uh, we'll, we'll take a, a brief look at those, but we won't be doing a, a great deal of programming today. So as we discussed, the, the I model itself is actually a SQLite DB, so you can download it, you can create an offline one, you can interrogate it with a, any of the, the SQLite tools that you may have available to you as well. But for those of us who are working online where the, the BIM model is, or the, the .BIM file, sorry, is stored online with Bentley, uh, we can use the uh, tool called iModel Console to interrogate data that's in that. So keeping in mind that the iModel may not contain the data that you want, or it may have a representation of data that you you can use some of or not all, or it may be uh, completely fantastic and have all the uh, the data residing within it. Um, that this will give us access to to have a look at those. So remember, yesterday we went through and created a uh, a sample I model of the Coffs Harbour. We did a, a quick start tutorial uh, application in here as well, and that gave us uh, a bunch of uh, GUID IDs that we can use within our application to to visualize that in the visualizer yesterday. We're going to use those same IDs today, or uh, probably we'll just point and click today, but uh, we'll use this web application quick start to have a look at the, the I model and the content that is provided within that I model in itself. So again, this is online. If it's offline, I would just use a, a SQLite DB tool to open that up and, and have a look at it. But here is a I model console itself. If I refresh that, we get the uh, the welcome screen again. It does come with a, a nice little uh, tutorial to take you through and how to do what you need to do, uh, where to click some predefined queries that we've got set up for you and, and things like that. So we'll, we'll just take a quick look in here. The reason that I, I can't take you through anything concrete is that each one is different. So when you federate that data that's coming in or uh, pull in you know, some IFC data here and some DGEN data there, that data is going to come with its own information uh, and layout around that. So where we try and sample, you know, is a beam, is it a column, is it a whatever the case happens to be, those base infrastructure objects, uh, we leave the data in its own in its own area. Um, so let's have a look and see how we get access to that one. 80 was the one I created yesterday, just so we're using the same one. Uh, there it is. So first of all, we need to tell it what project or iTwin ID we're working with. And then within that, it will actually show us the uh, the I model that's available to us. 
And because we do uh, changes over time, it will also ask us for a change set ID. So a change set ID is something we didn't talk about yesterday in great detail, but this basically is our, our timestamp, if you like, of data coming in. So at a, a certain milestone, perhaps it's a, a simple milestone like a day, or it could be a milestone such as, you know, this building is now as built or it's issued for construction or uh, we can actually timestamp that model and then we can roll backwards and forwards between those timestamps or those milestones that we set in the model. Uh, in this case, it's it's simple. So uh, we've only got one one change set ID in there. Uh, typically, you would uh, certainly have more than one. Uh, so when I click on that change set ID, the, the web app will go off and open that I model in the back end. That uh, should be pretty quick, uh, but you'll notice that we uh, only open that up in, in read only mode. So we have a way of reading it, of writing into an I model, uh, but the console is not how that happens. Uh, before I uh, scare myself with some SQL queries, once we've got an I model open there, we can use the schema explorer to have a look at all the tables and aspects that are provided within that I model. As I said, each, each one's going to be different. So this is the standard process that when you get data, you use the iTwin synchronizer tool or the snapshot tool or whatever it is to create your I model. Uh, typically, then the next thing that you do is open it up and say, well, <laughs> where am I going to get my data from? And there's two ways, of course, the visualizer, you can click on things, it will show up in the list. But if you need to write queries to pull that information out, maybe you're relating cameras to camera poles and rather than guessing at the X, Y, Z or lat long location of that camera, you know, the, it's already modeled in the, the 3D model. So we can just use the existing geometry to, to locate those kind of things in the system. Uh, so the I model schema lets us have a look through the, the back end of that I model. We can have a look at the, uh, the entities. And if you've had a look at the, the biz schema, this is all, all these sort of things are explained out in there. Um, it, Let's you drill in and see, you know, what's geometric, what's 3D, what's 2D, and you can write queries against all of that sort of information in the system as well. Um, any of the, the structure that we provide in is in there as well. And the list goes on and on. So we won't make this too extensive on uh, the Schema Explorer, but suffice to say that if you're coming in here and you're looking for information about something, uh, you can do a quick search. So yesterday, I think we had something on doors. And what you'll see is that uh, just by typing in the word door, we can see all the uh, all the door bits and pieces that are available to us in the model. A uh, quick run through these. So the architectural physical schema is where we amalgamate everything that says it's a door. So when we import doors from Revit and we import doors from IFC, uh, that's where we actually amalgamate all the door bits into the architectural physical uh, side of things. Uh, but again, we keep all of the information about those uh, in their separate repository groups. So here, uh, if we wanted to go and pull that information, um, the door ratings in that schema, that's what we're after. Uh, door type, it looks like it's all been merged into ArchViz. So that sounds good. So let's do this. So I can then take that classification structure out of here and using basic SQL commands, we can go and query that information, which is blank. That's a good example. <laughs> Let me try a wall dive in here. I did have one, but uh, I seem to have misplaced what it was. Hmm. Okay. Uh, anyway, so the information is uh, available. The structure of that information is available through the schema, and you can query that data through iModel console and, of course, through API commands in the visualizer um, as well. Here. All right. Um, so we briefly talked about the offline mode as well. So the iTwin snapshot tool uh, we won't go into again, but uh, that was. Uh, discussed yesterday. And we also have a sample Electron app uh, that's available to you uh, as part of the developing a desktop viewer uh, in the learning tutorials. So if you uh, trying to work offline, uh, you don't want to use the uh, the Bentley streaming service, that's fine. 
Uh, you can also create your own Electron desktop viewer uh, using the, the terminal. We won't go through and, and create them today though. All right, uh, let me find my cognito session. All right. So we had a look at developer.bentley.com yesterday and we went and created uh, some new I models and we had a look at where the, uh, the, the project IDs or the I twin IDs are created as well. That same website will take us to the documentation for the other APIs that are available. So not only do we have the, the visualization portion, which is covered up here at the top, uh, which will uh, basically take us back to, to creating that, that tooling that we created yesterday, but we also have a bunch of other tools that are available to you as part of the iTwin platform. So as, as part of that standard, we can do things like export IFC out of the I model. So the I model is a great way of federating disparate data because we can take sources from pretty much any, any CAD app. We can also turn that around and perhaps export that out to IFC uh, if, if required. I'm not sure how that would might fit in with your workflow. Typically that's used at an engineering firm where they need to hand that data over. So for example, hassles to CPB would hand that information over perhaps in an IFC as a standard format. Uh, if you're doing work with things like Unity or Unreal or HoloLens or any of those type of tools, uh, the standard file format there is the GLTF. So we also give you the ability to, to take your, your I model and export them as GLTF format into the system. Now, no one mentioned oil and gas yesterday, but we also have a, a, a tooling that allows you to take your PDF uh, PNIDs or scanned PNIDs in a, in a PDF format, and it will actually go through and uh, convert them to intelligent marked PNIDs and allow you to scrape things like tag numbers and uh, equipment off of those PNIDs in there as well. So if you're doing anything with uh, PNID style schematics, uh, we, we certainly have a tool in there too. The synchronization engine allows you to uh, do what we do in iTwin synchronizers, but in the portal. So you can load files into the storage, and we'll talk about storage in a sec, uh, and then write your own synchronization jobs that say, I want to sync uh, this DGN into this I model, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the transformation service allows you to take an I model and then uh, filter information out of that I model. So maybe you've uh, got a whole heap of data and you've wedged all that into an I model and it's just too much. There, there's lots of junk in there. There's things that you don't need. Uh, the transformation service allows you to, to cull out that junk and create a brand new uh, I model uh, from just the information that you want to pull out of there. So useful for, for culling out information. Also useful if you want to trim down something for export. So when you want to export uh, just say the, the structural steel out of there, what we do is we pass that through the transformation engine, create a new I model with only the, the structural steel, and then run that through the export or the mesh export tooling to get that out. The digital twin management uh, for I models is all about tracking those, those changes. So it's things like being able to create change sets, um, being able to interrogate, you know, what files are, are converted into the I model. And this is this is more not visual side but it's more of a um, what, what's actually in there for us to work with. We'll just take a second. So it's it's all about things like briefcases and change sets and locks and thumbnails and users and, and all those sort of bits of information as opposed to the, the visualization side of, of that I model in itself. Uh, the library tooling is around our, our uh, Oops, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. Uh, one of our tooling allows you to establish a library of components uh, from manufacturers, and you can place them in our CAD tool. So you can uh, place a you know a pump straight out of the category, and, uh, drop that into your model, and the the library API allows you to to mess with those digitalized components uh, in there as well. So not so much for the I model side, but more part of the uh, the, the platforming side. Uh, the reality data isn't actually probably as in depth as we'd like to see at this time, but it allows you to go through and create associations with your reality storage and your eye model, uh, allows you to in, have a look at the, um, the reality data and stuff like that. So it's not all, it's not actually about creating that reality data, it's more about interrogating the existing reality data uh, that you've got within the system. 
Save Views allows you to create snapshots in your iTwin so that someone can go in and click on that and then takes them to that point of view straight away. All right, storage is sort of twofold. So we have a, uh, for want of a better term, a Dropbox storage area within the platform that allows you to, you know, put your DGNs, your PDFs, uh, all that sort of information. Some of our exports, so when you export an IFC, it actually goes into that storage mechanism and we provide for the free development about a gig worth of storage there that you can load files into use as part of your synchronization into an i model um, or you know export ifcs out of uh, basically to to test and trial that so that is included um, as part of your, your platform free cost as well all right the projects we talked about yesterday but <clears throat> what we didn't really talk about is uh, things like being able to add users and create roles and all that sort of stuff. So within the project where the I model and the reality data might be stored, there's access to that information, which sort of goes hand in hand with the scope that the application has access to as well. So when you write an app, uh, you pick the scope as we did yesterday, uh, but the permissions for the user who's using that app also needs to be uh, set correctly so that they can interact or do things with that information uh, in the in the project itself. Uh, so from the the project side, here you can create new projects uh, if you need to add in as many users as you need. So if you're collaborating uh, across a team uh, and give them the permissions to you know view reality data, view I models, create things that we call issues and and forms and so forth. OK, on the user side, that's pretty straightforward. Users are nice and easy. They're the ones that uh, allow you to interact with the iTwin project and all the, the contents with, that's within that. So things like the storage, uh, reality data, I models, et cetera, et cetera. Um, context capture was sort of used over as well. This, If you're using context capture, this is an API that allows you to check on things like jobs and, and how the processing is going for converting that uh, reality, that, that photographic or um, recorded data uh, into re uh, 3D reality models. Uh, as part of the, the platform, we also provide things like clash detection. So you can see if a wall is clashing with a piece of pipe or some structure of whatever that case happens to be. So we can uh, basically clash check between geometric elements within the iTwin, and that's provided as a service, so you don't need to go and and create your own there. We also provide a, a property validation API as well. So you can look at the properties of your door and say, hey, that's a, a door of a type of DM. It should have been a value of something else. So it allows people to, to validate their BIM models because we're at that level, we're talking about BIM data, allows them to validate their BIM models are actually up to scratch on the data side, not necessarily the geometry side and that the, the properties that they need to fill in to fulfill their handover requirements uh, are actually in there as well. All right, so some more of the interesting ones have uh, the reporting and insights. So we've got a carbon calc API, which is uh, simplistically uh, uh, at the moment integrates with one click LCA. Uh, so I'm not sure if you're doing any embodied carbon calcs for any of your, your, your projects there, uh, but basically, we uh, allow you to, to push the aggregated data out of your model as per your EPDs uh, up into one click LCA at this time. So we're looking for other carbon providers to integrate with as well, uh, but that's that's quite simplistic. Uh, as part of our internal research projects, we've also uh, developed a classification ma machine learning tool. This allows you to pass your eye model off to that uh, machine learning tool and it will actually interrogate all the elements in that eye model and go well that should have been a beam or that should be classified as a door for example so it allows you to basically classification check uh, the elements within the the eye model itself uh, the o data uh, we'll have a look at and reporting we'll have a look at this afternoon but basically that's a way of getting a uh, uh, data stream into the I model. So we write a query uh, and then we uh, allow access to that via an O data method uh, to pull that information out. We'll actually uh, go in and have a look at that when we talk about uh, reporting and, and data analysis this afternoon. The reality data analysis tool, uh, again, we've done up some stuff. This was predominantly, if you're using context capture, for those of you who 
speaking about it previously, you would have seen this in context capture. This is uh, also being escalated up into a, a platform API. Uh, what this allows you to do is, uh, I'm waiting for some pretty pictures here. It allows you to load. Hmm. Where did my pictures go? Getting the detectors. Nope. Hmm. There we go. Um, it allows you to take your reality data, uh, run it through a, a process where it goes and identifies information within, within there. So you don't have to go and write that stuff yourself. Uh, you can, of course, uh, train it to pick up information that you're dealing with. And we've got some sample um, already done that'll do things like uh, some railway signaling, uh, cars, bikes. Uh, we should have some plant stuff in here as well. OK, railway lines, but uh, we should have some. OK, maybe not, uh, but we also have some, some plant ones as well. So this allows you to take that reality data that you may have captured from your iPhone or you know, drone flies, whatever it happens to be, and go and classify that. Uh, as we suggested yesterday, reality data is pretty dumb. It's just a bunch of triangles with some nice textures mapped against it. It is 3D, of course, uh, but some of the power comes out of being able to recognize that that is actually a signal or that is a, a railway line or you know, ballast, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there's a bunch of samples that go in here. I'll show you how to use these uh, in one sec. We'll just sort of run through and then we'll come back and, and cut them off. Uh, the reporting allows you to gather a bunch of information together and aggregate data from your from your iTunes, and we'll be having a, a further look at this API um, later on this afternoon. All right, since we have uh, a 4D or a history using our change sets within the I model, we also have a change elements API that will, uh, you can say, between these two milestones, show me all the stuff that's changed within my I model. And it'll spit back all the geometric stuff that's changed. So if a, a beam was moved or replaced or deleted and re-added or uh, new content was added, for example, so add, modify, or delete. But it'll also go through all the attributional uh, data that's associated to the elements in there and say, well, you know, this element is the same, this beam's the same, but they went and changed the attribute down here for uh, steel facing whatever it happens to be. And they will uh, pull that information out and, and give that to you as a as a nice, <laughs> a nice long list usually uh, in JSON format. Uh, for those of you who are doing input based work with your iTwin, uh, we also provide a, a forms and an issues uh, platform uh, already uh, created, ready to go. There's tons of samples on these, um, but it's a fantastic way of being able to get user input or feedback into your iTwin. So if there's an issue perhaps with the, the door on site, uh, you can have someone pull up your, your digital twin, uh, click on the door and raise an issue against the door to say this door does not appear to be shutting properly, whatever the case happens to be. And that provides things like routing and sign off and, and all that sort of informational context as well. So the issues, the forms are, are typically not used in conjunction uh, with the I model and push pins, but there's nothing, of course, stopping you doing that. It's more about um, being able to store form based data uh, that's ancillary or extra against that, that information there. And lastly, we have a, a web hooks API, which allows you to subscribe to events that are happening within the iTwin platform. So if data is being punched in, uh, we can track that information shoot this over here, uh, we can track that information um, and then respond to that event happening uh, within the system. Right, I thought we had a uh, question in there, but nope, it was Teams flashing for the fun of it. All right, so these are uh, quite simple to use. If you're using them with the visualizer, you can use you know, the fetch uh, tool to, to run an XHR query, or if it's, um, if you're just wanting to get in and give something a try, uh, we provide you with a, a Postman style interface into that already. So in here, uh, the user's one I picked because it's nice and simple. If you're logged into the developer portal, which I am, uh, you can use the, uh, the administration or the API on here. And there's a try it out button for everything in the system there. So I can hit try it out. I can ask it to authorize me which it will automatically do. 
uh, which it will automatically do and put the uh, the authentication token in here. And then I can run the the execute command down here. Okay. And uh, there is my uh, our result. So if I was to run that same query using a fetch, perhaps in a, in a JavaScript web app, uh, I'll get that same JSON response and I'll be able to process that in uh, whichever way I need to do that. If we go back here for a sec, let's find something a bit more meaty than one of those. Let's have a look at eye models. Um, so let's do change sets. Uh, let's do eye models first. So when I do something like uh, get project eye models, for example, uh, there's a bit of a spiel about, you know, we, we change the JSON depending on what your return requirements are. Um, you need this sort of authorization in order to be able to to uh, return that query without throwing a, an author is uh, uh, invalid access kind of thing. Uh, so from here again, I'm going to use my authorization code, but uh, while that's doing that, I'll just do this. I didn't snag one of those. I want to have a look at my own models. And let's just use this one, that'd be fine. So that's my iTwin ID there. Oops, missed again. There we go. So my project ID, iTwin ID, they're sort of uh, synonymous, but uh, we will be uh, renaming all these eventually in there. So here we'll just change the representation to full, and I'll go through and execute there. So that's the the sort of information that we can uh, get out of there. That would obviously be returned to our function, and then I can take you know the ID for my for my I model here. I'll just dupe this to have up, and we might want to get say the change sets out of that. Do we try it out here? And there's all the change sets within there. So you don't need to uh, to code up your your APIs. You can use them straight out of the developer.bentley.com site um, to to test. You've got uh, a quick start tutorial from yesterday in there that you can use, and uh, we're certainly open to any APIs that you think might be useful or missing. And uh, I urge you to uh, uh, to get in there and give them a go. So uh, I should probably talk about where I got the some of the limitation from. So in the pricing uh, tab here, you'll see that the the free trial, which is basically what everyone's running under now, is uh, it gives you access to all iTwin services, uh, one gig of storage. So that's the uh, the storage in there. We give you community support, and of course, you're welcome to uh, to ping myself or Shree for for assistance at any time. And uh, typically it's for non-commercial use only. Right? So it's all about um, getting in there and, and giving that, that a try out, which uh, is covered there. I'm not sure whether Shree's got any extra to add on there for academic. No, but I'm good in there. I mean, um, what is available to the, the open ecosystem of commercial customers is available to the academics, plus the value add would be that is you can lean back on the learning tutorials that are available, and then maybe through the email, you can even reach out to Ron because Ron is based in Australia. So, and Ron would respond back to you if you if you have a question within a reasonable time. Fantastic, thanks, Shri. And we also have uh, uh, other resources there. So, education.bentley.com has a fantastic portal where you can jump on there now that you've got a. A login, of course. Uh, actually, I don't think you need a login for some of these. Uh, you can jump in there, and we basically uh, do tutorials on how to use our products and um, get the most out of them uh, as part of the uh, the Bentley Education Portal as well. Uh, so this is the the iTwin specific one. So this is the uh, iTwin developer one. Uh, at the end of it, we will give you a badge if you like to do the uh, the questionnaire. At the end, there's a a bunch of questions on. On what you've learned over the course of the the accreditation course, uh, but this will actually take you through 
I, we don't have time to unfortunately uh, handhold through this in the, in a two day session, but this will take you through uh, standing up a, a, an iTwin viewer, which is what we did yesterday. Uh, it uses the the house model, which is similar to the, the model that we were using, but it then goes ahead and adds decorators in uh, to show where the IoT or the, the sensor equipment actually is. Uh, it then goes and pulls the sensor data in uh, from uh, a static uh, JSON, but that uh, in theory could be a, a live data feed as well. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and it also shows you how to create tools that interact with uh, elements in there. So definitely uh, if you're, you're keen on doing or showing uh, IoT data in a 3D model, uh, this course is, is definitely the way to go. I'm going to stick that in the chat window as well. All right, so I know that was very whirlwindy. Uh, the idea being that you you get an idea that not necessarily you know exactly what all the APIs are available to, but you have an understanding that uh, if you go to developer.bentley.com and have a look at the APIs, there may be something in there that will save you some time and effort of uh, actually writing that up yourself, and you'll be able to get some benefit out of it. If there are any questions, I'm happy to to take them now. Yep. Uh, and then if you can enable the text boxes, please. Thank you. So API questions. OK, that's that's good. Uh, there's uh, a bunch in there. As I said, they're, they've all got tried out. So if you uh, want to add them into your app, definitely give the tried out a go first to understand how they work and what's required and then you can uh, throw them in as, as fetch requests into your app. Nice and simple. Yep, it looks like uh, you were so crystal clear there was no question from, so. <laughs> uh, I wish I wish that was the case. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, that's uh, good stuff. And of course, we always talk about things like JavaScript, but you can write in any tooling that you choose. So if C Sharp's your thing, they're just web requests. If PowerShell's your thing, we've got samples for PowerShell as well. That's not my thing, so I, I can't tell you what those are. Uh, but uh, and of course, JavaScript is in there as well. And if C++ is your thing, you can certainly, or VB, VB.net, et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't, uh, the good thing about the web tech is it's it's pretty uh, platform agnostic. Use whatever you like. All right, so uh, the Federation of Data for Communicate Between the There's Robots. A There's a question, Matt. Yeah, I, we don't have one of those at this stage. That would, uh, <clears throat> you'd need to interface between that in your own, your own way. What, uh, what robots did you have in mind? And the only reason I say that is, you know, we've got uh, data collectors on odd things that uh, I don't know about, but we've got a whole sense metrics arm of Bentley that I'm not 100% uh, up on what they're doing as well. So I can I can chase that up if you yep. care, to, care to explain that a bit more. Yep, Connie, if you can possibly explain a little more about what kind of robot uh, smart plans. Yeah. No, sorry, I, I'm drawing a blank there. But if you've got a, a sample or something that you can shoot yeah. through, I'll uh, I'll chase up with our plant site team who do most of our plant site work and see what, what we've got happening there. And what kind of communication mode that are there for the robo and then, you know, what are the APIs that are available for the uh, your, your robo there? So we can find out how we can. A little more detail on that. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, so when we talk about data, there's data all over the place. Um, if we remember back to, to Dave's 2.4 terabytes worth of data yesterday, uh, but there's data all over the place. There's, uh, you know, obviously there's data that's external that's coming from sensors. There's data that's been modeled that's internal to uh, the information that you pulled into your your iTwin, so you know whether that came through IFC, DWG, or whatever the case happens to be. Um, there's data that 
can chat between both or there's data where you might need to join both together. So typically that data that's internal into the models that you pull in uh, is data that was done for design. So they're all the design requirements or design settings against those types of objects uh, that may not actually make it out in the real world. Um, and let's, uh, we'll, we'll have a look at some of those ideas in there as well. So that external data can come from anywhere. So when we're talking you know, plant design, we're talking things like uh, engineering data warehouse perhaps, or uh, uh, and that's, we're not talking necessarily Bentley technology here. We're talking you know, external vendors, in-house design systems, all sorts of weird stuff. But external data comes from all over the place. So it could be the, the sensors that are coming off the, the building, you know, is it vibrating X, Y, Z? Uh, what sort of parameters is that sitting at? Uh, can come from databases because there's information stored everywhere, uh, even people's desks, unfortunately. But it could come from things like document management. And it all depends on what your target is with your, your digital twin. So your digital twin, if you were to, even though we've got a, a schedule about what, what the definition of a digital twin is, if you go and talk to an engineer and electrical and say, hey, what does a digital twin mean to you? He's going to say something completely different to what a water user is going to do, to what a water maintenance tech is going to do, to what an instrument tech is going to do. All sorts of um, different job titles have different requirements about what they need out of their, their digital twin within the model. And it's impossible to stuff all that information, in all honesty, into a, a single interface uh, that lets people do that. There's just uh, uh, too much information in there. All right. but in each one of those circumstances where you're dealing with external data, there needs to be some sort of business key between those two. So if we're talking about, you know, a water meter point, that meter is going to have some sort of ID. We're going to have to match that ID up with something that's being modeled in the digital twin. Uh, and that way we can correlate that data easily so that when the user clicks on the decorator or on that piece of geometry, we can pull that information from wherever it's coming from, SCADA, et cetera and say, hey, that business key matches that business key. Let's present that data off to the user uh, on screen. So the, the business key is the key, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the same, but there needs to be some way of relating uh, what you've got in geometry and what you've got in data uh, together so you can show that information off to the, uh, the end user. Now, when it comes to reality data, obviously that uh, disappears completely, right? Because reality data has none of that key. It's just triangles with pretty images or even point clouds. You know, they're just a bunch of dots in space. So your business key in that case may be the location of the geometry in X, Y, Z, lat long, uh, may be the only way you can get your business key. You can, of course, uh, run it through our, our system and train the, uh, the extractor to extract bounding boxes for uh, equipment styles within the reality mesh, and then you can start applying business keys or logic to those as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a total loss. If you haven't got a, a business key that links the two elements, you can go off other things such as uh, location and space or, or a general uh, mismatched uh, sort of key in there as well. All right, so as an example, we had, a, I think Dave showed one of the uh, Azure Digital Twin demos that we did, so the Civil IoT demo, uh, which we also have on GitHub if you want to uh, have a look at how we rigged all that up to, to work together with the, the iTwin visualizer. But in general, uh, as Bentley, we don't supply everything, so we're supplying part of the equation here. We're not expecting people to take everything that they have and pour that into an I model. That is certainly not the purpose of the, the way uh, a digital twin should work, right? So we see that as, as being an open uh, platform. We've provided a, a bunch of tools, a nice visualization tools that runs on any platform, over the web, locally, whatever the case happens to be. But to relay the rest of that informational data in, we're relying on other people such as you know um, Azure to pull that data or collate that sensor data. Uh, in their IoT hub and then push that out as part of their, their digital twin experience uh, into, or, or make accessible, sorry, through their, their Azure digital twin experience so that we can uh, pull that data through into our iTwin viewer and do things with it. So show something failing in red, 
bring attention to the user by, you know, toasting, putting toast messages on the screen, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the same applies to, to any of those uh, style of events. So if you've ever been in a control room, they work in a similar schematic based fashion uh, where the, the user has access to that sensor data from field, uh, but it interacts with the, the schematic uh, on screen to show them what part of the process is potentially affected or failing uh, on screen. And here, what we're trying to do is add a, a bit more context around that and take digital twins to everybody by giving them the full context of the 3D model uh, in the eye twin view in there instead. All right, so that's uh, a general. So you can basically wipe out if you're not an Azure fan or a Microsoft fan, you can wipe that out and then put in uh, the Amazon stuff up the top there if you want. Uh, you can put in something completely unrelated. So if you've got uh, sensors in your house, uh, some of that Bunnings gear, uh, you can certainly hook into that data as well and then you know directly hook that in. But the the general idea is that. When we talk about federating data, we're talking about uh, the presentation layer or bringing that data together, not necessarily picking up all that data where it stands and then putting it into uh, our Bentley I model as such. So we don't want you picking up and putting data in the I model that probably isn't already in the I model uh, to start with. So some of the examples of that, and as I said, this one's on GitHub. This is the one that Dave showed uh, where we pull the asset types from Azure Digital Twins. Uh, list them in a nice uh, interface on the left and then allow you to uh, query them either as decorators on the model or as an impact uh, against the elements in the physical model. I won't, because uh, Dave did such a good job, we won't spend too much time on that one. But uh, that's the currently the most common thing we see for, for digital twins is more the showing of the user. So the user gains the knowledge, applies the wisdom, to uh, rectify that sort of uh, information that's that's coming in or the, the problem that's at hand. Um, some of the other examples that people have uh, gently dipped into are things like uh, being able to apply camera feeds. So this is part of the, the digital Bill Britain. Uh, within that model, the camera towers were all modeled with a nice little camera. Thank you to uh, whoever did that, by the way. And, and the, the camera number or location was actually uh, supplied in there. Now, Highways England already had a, a GIS tooling where they had the cameras mapped by XYZ location into GIS. Uh, so the easy flip for them was to say, well, that camera number equates to that camera feed. And then when people hover over the, the little camera decorator on screen, uh, they get the camera feed for that camera from that tool. So something that's very simple, took them about an hour to actually get up and running because the data was already there. So they already had the camera feed with a known ID. They already had the cameras in the model with a known ID. And they simply queried, uh, when you hover over the camera, they simply queried the ID and pull up the uh, the camera feed in a nice little widget box uh, in there as well. All right, but taking that a step further, this is uh, one of our um, use cases was the, the Doosan uh, wind farm. Uh, there's a nice, we've got a great uh, YouTube video. I didn't want to sit here and play a YouTube video for you, so I <laughs> thought we'd just go through and do a bit of a discussion about it. So the, the Doosan wind farm was modelled up. Uh, we took all that and, and put that into the iTwin visualizer, which you can see in the background there. Uh, it's a bit of an, an older shot there. Uh, we then took all the information that was coming in uh, from the historian, I think, from memory and uh, relayed that up on the screen so that the operators could actually see what was happening with any of those turbines at any given time uh, in the system there. Uh, we went a, a, a bit of a step further and they had an AI model already done for predicted power output based on weather. And we incorporated that charting into uh, the visualizer down the bottom as well. So you can actually slide along that chart and it will show you uh, which ones are uh, uh, also due for, I think they had maintenance uh, added in there at the same time. And then, of course, we hooked up into the live data with a bit of historical data in there as well. So you can have a look at the, you know, the two hour output for that turbine or the 15 minute output for that. And we'll also list any of the, the warnings that uh, are present within the system for that particular item uh, that you've, you've hovered over or that particular turbine. 
So we've got a, a fantastic video. You'll, you'll definitely find that on uh, YouTube. It's the Doosan Wind Farm. Let me just put that name in the chat there. As, a, as an example. All right, so that's a, a sample of taking a, a visualization, an IFC model, a CAD model, a BIM model, a reality mesh, and then being able to overlay that with data that's sitting uh, outside the iTwin ecosystem. We had a look at the, the APIs and there's a, there's a bunch of stuff there, I understand, uh, but we also can use that as internal data inside the iTwin ecosystem. So for example, when we import the IFC or if uh, Cheryl gets that model from Hassels and, and loads it in, she'll see all the design time values that were applied to those elements in CAD. So, you know, the, the beams, they'll have a, a a height, a width, a length, a, a, a rating, they'll have a type, all sorts of information is stored within that um, within that model itself. So with those design values, if that's something that you're looking at interacting with, we can certainly query that data out of the um, the, the iTwin itself using things like uh, iModel Console to guide us, and then we can take those, those SQL queries and port them into our app um, quick, quite quickly. <clears throat> Okay, so we also have things like uh, user-based forms in there. So if you're using SharePoint, maybe you're doing your forms in SharePoint. If you're not using things like SharePoint and you need a forms engine, we uh, we certainly provide one of those. And you can link them off into the system and you can add decorators. We store X, Y, Z locations for click things and stuff like that. Uh, Catalogs we touched on briefly, uh, but it allows you to uh, you know pull that catalog data out into uh, into there as well. Uh, we also have a, a couple of other plugins that um, we have in uh, one of our products, and that's uh, contextual data around things like geo photos. So the ability for people on site, again, you know, public feedback kind of thing, to to take photos, they get submitted up into the storage, and then we uh, basically scrape that storage for the uh, lat long locations of the photos, because everything that you take now is uh, is all stored for lat longs. Uh, and then we can uh, expose those out to the user as well. So it's not just, you know, information that's coming from SCADA, uh, that sort of low level uh, data, but we can also use uh, live you know, feeds. We can also pull uh, contextual data, you know, stored geo photos, for example. And, and of course, we, we've discussed uh, clash validation and, and stuff like that along the way and the RDA that's in there too. All right, so using your iTwin as a source, uh, we had a quick look at iModel Console, but those same EC SQL queries uh, transport across. I won't go into the EC SQL primer. If you've written SQL statements before, I'm, I'm sure you're, uh, you, you're quite capable of, of writing those in too, but it gives you the ability to do things like export them out to other tools. So you may be using the iTwin data, not necessarily as a visualizer, but you may be using it as a source for data in a different project that you're working on and you, you want to use uh, or pull information out of the iTwin, not necessarily visualize it, uh, but pull that data out and link that up with some other tool that you're working on or that's already in play at that organization. Uh, we can certainly do that as well. Uh, so I'm pretty agnostic when it comes to tooling. Uh, if uh, a customer is already using something, there's there's not necessarily any need for us to go and replace that tooling, but maybe we can you know enhance it with data that they didn't know they had uh, by pulling that in from uh, Navisworks or IFCs and and combining all that data into a different type of container. All right, so that's uh, that's a general overview of of where the data would come from maybe that was probably a bit high level for the audience uh, in play but if you've got any questions please uh, shoot them into the, the the chat box I'm just while well, waiting if anyone else has got questions, Cheryl here. I just missed the bit yesterday where you provided the link, um, the easy link to, for people to be able to engage in the free trial 
if you've got it handy there. Is it just platform, Bentley platform? I'll probably just Google it myself, but if you've got it handy, you can pop it into the chat bar. I'll um, yeah. so developer.bentley.com is the developer.bentley.com. Oh, yeah, Great. There's a couple. Uh, let me give you all three into the chat link. Uh, so if you don't have a Bentley account, which I'm pretty sure you probably would. Mm. Um, it's also to let colleagues know who maybe haven't dived into the Bentley experience yet, so that'd be super helpful. Did not paste as I expected it to. Let me uh, sign out here. Oh, I live in America. That's awesome. Thanks, Bentley. All right, let me just do that. On teams. All right, so uh, first thing you need to do is create an account. Developer.bentley.com will get you some of the way. Uh, if you're predominantly interested in the visualizer aspect, uh, itwinjs.org is the, uh, the place mm -hmm. you want to be. Um, hang on, I'd better grab my other window for this one. Uh, education's already done. If you're looking for any of our samples or anything like that, uh, iTunes on GitHub. So there's a absolute bunch there. All the biz schemas are in here as well. If you want to see what they look like, of course they're in the learning page as well. But there's you know all the sample apps and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, that one will do. Uh, so the the quick start that we started off was the one, two, three. We we did one and two yesterday um, from the tutorials here. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. Can uh, break for lunch if you like, Shri. Yep. No other questions there. Uh, if there is any more question, we'll give a minute more. Otherwise, we break for lunch and play your thoughts on. I'll we'll back at uh, one o'clock. Uh, yeah, one o'clock's fine. Yep. Oh, sorry. So because because we can't do omniverse. Um, yep. That'll make us short today. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about quantification and reports. Yep. yep. And, and now I, I would have liked to taken you all through exporting your I model to Unreal and Unity, but unfortunately, that's. Uh, I think that might be a bit fraught with danger for us all to to dive in there. So we'll we'll have a general discussion on it. It's not uh, something that I can probably squeeze into thirty minutes with a step through, uh, yep. but we'll we'll see how we go. Welcome back, everyone. Who oh, have signed it? So now the stage is back to on. Thanks, Shri. Okay. All right. So uh, the next session is is something that we've sort of covered before, but it's uh, about reporting. Uh, I thought we'd do a quick recap. So obviously, iModel console that we went through uh, allows you access into the schema of the iModel as well as being able to interrogate the data using using SQL queries. There's a there's a whole heap of stuff there. So whatever you can do in SQLite, you can write a query uh, against uh, the iModel in iModel console or or your app, of course, to to pull that in. Um, there was a comment made about some of the stuff that we we talked about previously. Um, so here's an example. This was the okay. So as uh, in my job, I'm not allowed to actually write applications as such uh, because that uh, <laughs> forms a commercial app from from Bentley itself. So I can write sample code and and things like that. So as an example, here's the the uh, part of the query that we used in the I model to get the cameras for the highways sample that you saw previously, where it shows the the, the cameras 
screen. Uh, so we go through, we can write a query in the I model, we can get the results of that query, iterate through the rows. Uh, hopefully there's only one because it's a specific camera. And then we we attach that marker to the uh, the camera location in in the eye model itself. Uh, one of the other ones I dug out was so we we also talked about using uh, a simple fetch command in in JavaScript to go and grab information from the API. Uh, so in this case we're we're pulling issues out of the issues resolution system in uh, in iTwin platform. And you can see that we're using simple fetch calls just to, to those URLs, which you can, of course, test uh, at the developer.venly.com site. Uh, and we're just pulling them out, making sure that their status is OK, and then continuing on the, the process. So in this case, this was a, a creation of an issue. Uh, we just enhance one of the samples that that's delivered there. Hopefully that uh, that helps with any of those questions that were, were raised over lunch. So that's the uh, the fetch sample. So uh, of course, if you're using some other language, it'll be a, some sort of HTTP request in there uh, to that API. And for a, a query that we've we've got on screen, uh, that's uh, that same uh, EC SQL query uh, can be used in iModel console against this iModel to return those those results there. Uh, so the reporting uh, widget can be used that way as well. So in iModel console, we can dump a CSV if that's your thing, uh, and that can be uh, taken somewhere else. Of course, you can write EC SQL in your app, but we also provide other ways of analyzing that data. So we give you access to a, a Power BI connector that lets you connect Power BI up to your, your iModel. Uh, Power BI is obviously <laughs> quite widely used. It's quite a uh, a powerful uh, visualization tool for for data in itself, uh, and you can grab that from. I will post this in the in the chat window. If I can get this launch. Yeah, let's tear this thing off. Uh, so it's up in the uh, the Bentley community site, and we'll just pop that in the chat window for anyone who wants to grab it. Uh, you can use it against uh, Power BI, of course. And there is a slight uh, setup that needs to be done. So if you're not familiar with Power BI and custom uh, extensions, you'll need to follow step three here to uh, to get that loaded. So you basically download this MES from the link here, uh, pop it in a custom connectors uh, folder under the Power BI desktop in documents. And when you open Power BI, you need to uh, allow an extension that's that's not validated, basically. Uh, we promise you no harm or ill will with our MES, uh, in all honesty. Uh, so it, it's safe to, to go ahead and do that for, for the connector listed here. And then when you use the connector, you'll see that it's uh, simply using uh, similar parameters to the rest of the API. So it will ask you for the iTween or the project ID, the iModel ID, and the, the SQL query that you want to run against that, that iModel in itself. Um, yeah, and then once that data comes back in its its tablex form, uh, you can churn that into whatever you want. So you can go and chart things or or uh, manipulate that table in any way you see fit uh, within the system there. So if you're doing any uh, reporting, usually commercial entities like Power BI, nice and simple to get around in. Um, definitely the the Power BI connector is there for you to to utilize in there too. Uh, we are sort of moving away from that MES that involves a lot of uh, support and, uh, and and developer access and product managers and basically human time at Bentley. So we're sort of moving away from the MES as it stands now and moving into a, uh, a standardization of, of, of using an, an, an O data. The, the plan was today to, to pull a, a grouping and mapping widget in to the iTwin viewer we used yesterday. And I'm certainly happy to uh, to take you through that. In the essence of time, I've also gone and just uh, uh, done that uh, up already in the uh, in the spa that we used yesterday. Oh, we've jumped too far ahead. Yeah, uh, get rid of that. All right, go away. Uh, okay, so if you remember, we pulled in the grouping and mapping widget yesterday uh, as a, as an example. In the same components 
uh, React repository in, in the iTwin uh, organization on GitHub. Uh, you will find that we also have a, um, a reports configuration widget in there too. Now it uses the same scopes, so you shouldn't need any changes if you followed along from yesterday, and the permissions are, uh, are still the same as what we had previously. Uh, to add this one in, you'll need to drop that in your app.tsx file, so do the import for the, the widget. You'll need to do a npm installation on that uh, repo there, and uh, I'll show you where I'll pop this later. And of course, it needs to be added to the uh, the UE provider as well. Just hop back here. So at the top, we've uh, imported the reports uh, config provider and the widget as requested. Uh, we've also added it into the iModel app initialization call. And we've added it into one of the user interface providers uh, in the app as well. So the end result of that is a new widget uh, that's been added into my SPA app from yesterday. So yesterday we had been grouping and mapping, and today we've got the reports config added in here as well. So I'll take you through a, a quick setup of the uh, grouping and mapping and then publishing that to a report. Uh, I think we can probably uh, hook that up into Power BI as well. The, the grouping and mapping widget is, is part of the core of our um, carbon reporting tool. So there's two stages to the carbon reporting tool. One is actually pushing the, the grouping of data as per the EPDs into something like one-click LCA. Uh, and the uh, the other part of that is the actual pushing of that data into, into one-click. So we've got grouping and mapping to be able to uh, collaborate, uh, coagulate all that data together uh, against the various EPDs and then uh, the ability to push that in. Uh, so we'll do something simple today. What I was going to do is uh, I've just created a, a new mapping here. I'll just go and delete this actually. Just so we can start from scratch here. So when you start up there, there's of course no mappings against that I model. So I'm just going to create a new one and we're interested in say doors. And you can group these for, for different purposes, right? So in this case, we, we actually want to extract that data. Out. Uh, once you've created a group, we need to uh, enter into that group. Uh, and then from here, we can actually pull out uh, or grab disparate information and pool it together into that group. So if you have, you know, door type A, door type B that you want to pool into here, and you can't select them with a single query in whatever way, shape, or form because of the way the, the model is constructed, that's okay. That's what this tool allows you to do. So as part of the group details, I'll call it door A. Uh, there's a different ways that you can group. One is by selection, so I can click on something and then filter, or I can type in query keywords. Uh, personally, I always use selection. It's just simplistic. I've got the model in front of me. I can just go and click on the, the thing that I'm looking for. Uh, what that does is it adds into uh, the, the widget here all the properties of the thing that you've just clicked on. So if we're only concerned about perhaps uh, pulling doors from penthouse exterior, Okay, so we can see that that's going to give us too much, but we also want to just limit the category down to a door. I can go through and tick on them. Uh, now, for example, if uh, that still gave us too much information, I could delve into the properties that are against those objects, and perhaps we can filter further by using, you know, OmniClass on there. I'm not sure why that's just popped up there, or any of the other uh, attributes that sit alongside um, that door. OK, that's going to ruin my door A's and B's, and I'll take a look at that after the course. Uh, but in general, for the idea is that you're here to gather that information together. So I'm just going to turn this off, and hopefully that'll give us a decent filter. There we go. OK, so that's going to get everyone. So we won't we won't actually create two groups because I've been able to group them all by by one group. Uh, but this allows you to go in, pick those elements and then filter them out. Uh, so you can pull them, and it was designed for EPD. So for your EPD, you'd be pulling a certain type of thing to, to, to publish in there. All right, so once I've managed to narrow down my um, 
my selection set there. I can save that off. And that's added a, a group against uh, my, my, so that's added a mapping against the group uh, in there. Now I can change the visualization for that. And unfortunately those red markers are in the way. So let me just see if we can get that to, to update here. And it'll actually show me all of those. So if the model changes at any shape time in the future, I can come back and revalidate that those things are still part of that group um, visually on screen without having to, to go and do anything there. Now within that as well, we can then start extracting properties out. So this is all part of the, uh, the, re the reporting side of it. So not only have we said, okay, pick all those elements, but now we want to add the properties that we want to extract out of there. And we, we can make these up on the fly. So in this case, the property name might be, uh, let's see if this is going to work, your type. And it's going to be a string just to make life simple. Uh, it's not a quantity, but we could obviously make quantities in there if we want to. It's coming out of uh, door. No, it's door. Yep. Uh, what are we after? Door type. Door type down here. And then I can save that away and go and add uh, another one. We can also add calculated properties. So if the information that you're chasing isn't actually in um, the model, or I'm sorry, is it actually in the model, you can go and, and select on those. So maybe you need to uh, aggregate or, or report on all the shortest, shortest edge lengths of those doors because they need a certain swing or whatever the case happens to be. Uh, you can go and pick on those. Um, and you can also add your own custom calculations. So if you have a, a formula of something that you're trying to get out for a specific object type, you can go and, and plug that detail into there as well. So I'm going to keep it simple because <laughs> I'm not uh, on a good track record at the moment. Uh, so we'll just pull the, the door property out of the, the system and have that uh, exposed as part of my report. Now I can go and add as many groups as I want. So if we wanted to do windows as well, so here we've got a curtain wall that is resembling a window, we can go through and add those groups in. So we might be doing windows and doors and floors and et cetera, et cetera. And we can uh, pull all them up as, as much as we need to report on that, that data itself. So the reports config allows me to go and create a report that exposes this through the OData channel. Just pop that there for when I come across it next week and go, what did I do there? Um, so in that report, we then go and link that to our mapping. So here's the O data feed that we can use to get that information out of our reporting tool. So something like Power BI, for example, or whatever you're using uh, to yank O data out. Um, and I can go and add my uh, mapping in from that quick start tutorial. There's my doors mapping that we just created. And I can add that in. Now I can add in obviously multiples depending on how I want my report uh, structured and what information I want back in that table. So I probably wouldn't bind my windows in here, but we might bind different types of doors or different attributes from doors, for example, into that report feed. Okay, so at the risk of uh, it all going crazy, I'm just going to jump back in here and make sure that mapping stuck. Yep, it did. That's good. I'm going to jump back here and uh, let's see if this is going to go. Now, the uh, extraction does run on the reporting side on our side uh, for the OData, so it um, if we have a monitor that monitors the I model for any changes and we will basically update and create a, a static data set on our side that you report against when you use that O data link. And there's a couple other things that you need to do for reports. I think I've got saved off as well. Beauty. I'll just get this started up here. I can get out of the way. Uh, okay, so developer.bentley.com. 
in the reporting uh, documentation. Uh, so we go through and have a chat about uh, report API mapping. So this is what the widget does for us, uh, the extraction process. Again, the widget takes care of all that sort of stuff. Uh, and, and from here, we can go and then then have a look at that information. So that's what the, the widget does on our behalf. It takes care of, um, of, of setting up that OData chain. But what we're after at the moment is a way of accessing that, that OData. So it's all locked away. Obviously, the the I model that you have is registered to you as part of the web application tutorial, so it's secure. Uh, I can't just send that O data to you guys and, and have you access uh, that information from there. Uh, so what we need to do is add an API key uh, against the reporting mechanism. So we'll call it um, example, and it has an expiry date as well. So uh, these don't live on forever and your data is not accessible by someone who probably shouldn't have access to that data in there. Uh, okay, that hasn't filtered through yet. Maybe it's still running that extraction. Okay, that should be all right. Get it to redo the update. So that appears 180 is the one I'm looking for. Shouldn't take too much longer. All right, so I'm just going to bail out of that. I might just refresh this. Enough, let's see if we've got one now. Oh, but yeah, it's still thinking. Beautiful. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, 180, wasn't it? There we go. Uh, and there's my report in there. And I can save that off. All right, now the reason that we're doing this is we're getting an API key. And that allows us to authenticate uh, Power BI, for example, or whatever is pulling the, uh, the OData out uh, against that OData source without having to have a, an interactive login. Because uh, the last thing you want if you're using a, a background engine that's non-interactive uh, is for a login box to pop up on the server and uh, no one ever gets to see it. So I'm just going to copy that key and paste it off screen. Beautiful. And then in Power BI, fingers crossed, uh, we should be out of those. You can see my test one from last week. Um, we can go and get that data. And of course, I forgot what the tech guy did. I clicked the URL. Let's see. Okay, did. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. 
And that'll be because I've got crash credentials for my other test. Dang it. Um, OK, so here's one I prepared earlier. And basically, uh, you end up with a, if we do a quick edit here. Come back over here. Um, so that's our uh, door mapping that I created uh, as part of the test. You'll see that we get our, our unique identifier for the I model so that you can relate or your business key back into the element in the I model. Uh, the class IDs, we get bounding boxes, things like that. But we also get any of the information that we pulled out as part of that report uh, into the uh, into the table that's responded back uh, from that OData query. Uh, then, of course, in Power BI, you can do whatever you want with it. So here we just threw it into a simple donut, um, which lets people you know, click on or hover over and get information back. All right, let me get out of Power BI. That's fantastic. All right, so that's the grouping and mapping widget. We'll get you there. You can, of course, if you're so inclined, uh, create all those groups and all that mapping stuff uh, by manually using the uh, the API uh, yourself. Uh, but uh, just to make life easy, use the grouping and mapping widget from the viewer components and add in the reporting uh, widget in there as well. Uh, we also have another tool that's widely used by industry, and that's called the iModel Reporter. It's uh, at itwin. Uh, organization under the iModel Reporter. There, let's just fire that up. What that does is, it's a really, it's a bit of sample source code, but it goes and downloads the iModel, so the BIM file to your local machine, then runs uh, queries against that that you put into your into a structure and spits them out as CSV files. So if you're looking for something that's perhaps offline -y or an example of how to get data out of there or do other interesting things, uh, we usually update this one with some, some weird new stuff. Uh, that is also another good sample uh, that we, we provide. So if you're looking for something official, uh, the OData is the is the official path and a nice path for industry. If you're looking for something where you write your own or, or code up your own, uh, the uh, data, the iModel extra reporter tool here allows you to uh, take that and then uh, bend it to your will. Uh, it does work offline, so it downloads the model and then works offline. And of course, it can work on an offline model as well if you uh, are using offline models. But that's, uh, that's pretty much it for reporting, um, pulling quantities out uh, as they're all stored as properties, of course, and being able to get access to that data using either OData or or uh, some other tool. Is there anything that anyone has a question on or wants to see? Feel free, please open up if you have any questions. Yeah, on. maybe you can get to the next one, Matt. Thank you. Okay, keep on going. Yep, no worries. Yep. Okay, so uh, the last two topics today are about uh, getting your iTwin data and taking it somewhere else. And the question often comes up as to why would you actually want to do that? So uh, iTwin is pretty cool. We we do some some nice stuff. We give you access to lots of APIs and tools, uh, but it's not made for that. Uh, visualization experience right so it's not there as a as a fully ray terrace sort of gaming engine style um, tool that that you can do a, a whole bunch of other stuff with as well and uh, a lot of the gaming engines are sort of no code uh, style tools as well so you can drag and drop things around and you can uh, present the the 3d data in a different way to to your audience so it all depends on again what your audience is trying to get out of it um, some people have Unity programmers because Unity's been around for a long time. So we've got lots of organizations that actually uh, do a lot of collaboration work in the iTwin. 
but then they'll spit that out to Unity because they've already got existing tools in Unity or they're using that as part of their AR, VR platform, et cetera, et cetera. But so I won't go in and, and tell you all about the Unreal Engine, only that it, uh, Unreal 5 looks uh, pretty great. I Unfortunately, this is not my area of expertise, so I, uh, I may stumble around a little bit here. But uh, certainly, the uh, the export side of it, uh, I can I can lend you a hand on. Once you get it into Unreal, wow, well, you're on your own there. Uh, so we have a bunch of tutorials on getting the the export out to Unreal. The video from Mike is about 45 minutes. He does a fantastic. A uh, fantastic job of taking a uh, what we have a, as a synchro model. So the synchro tooling allows you to apply 4D characteristics to elements. So where an eye model will track change over time, uh, synchro allows you to say this beam is going to be constructed on this date, so make it appear on this date. Uh, this uh, slab will appear on this date, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it allows you to do 4D construction uh, simulation scheduling. Uh, so Mike takes a, a 4D model from Synchro and then runs that through the export tooling, uh, flips you into Unreal, and then shows you how to extract that 4D timeline uh, from the Synchro model and uh, use that in Unreal. So we've got a, a couple of tutorials in there as well. Top over here. And there are some specific requirements for Unreal. Now, if you're an Unreal uh, person, you've <laughs> probably gone through and uh, definitely know all this stuff. But for those of you who might be new to Unreal, uh, let's see if we can find it. Here we go. Um, there is a bit of a uh, step to, to get into Unreal. So we've got a, a bunch of tutorials. And as you can see, uh, they, uh, they go for a bit longer than I could certainly fit in uh, in today's course there. Now, when you step out to Unreal, you go from uh, an eye model into a thing called a data smith. And the data smith is where you actually uh, apply uh, some of the logic into, uh, into that translation across. And then once it goes into Unreal, you can then go forth and uh, apply better information into it there and, and schedule cameras and, and interactive elements and stuff like that to move around. Uh, so we make a plugin for the data smith that allows you to import the export, if you like, um, from iTwin and then utilize that within uh, an Unreal project. So I will leave you uh, with that slide for a, a couple of seconds. Again, unfortunately, not, not the expert in this one and definitely uh, can't step you through that process because it's it's a bit of a, a lengthy process. But if you if you want to know more, uh, we have all the tutorials set up in developer.bentley.com uh, for Unreal. They do take about two hours to actually uh, wander through if you're relatively proficient with Unreal. If you're not, uh, it took me about five hours to actually do my first one. Uh, trying to figure out where everything was and, and why it was there. Uh, but certainly, certainly well worth the effort if you are taking out to Unreal for, for a visualization aspect. Uh, what I might do is just throw up the Unity one as well. Uh, Unity's a bit neater. So remember, we uh, talked about a GLTF export as part of our, our platform API. Uh, we provide you with the tooling to actually stream from iTwin uh, into Unity. And we've got a, a resident uh, Unity expert, Matt Gooding, who would be uh, definitely happy to, to sit down and chat with you if you're doing anything out into Unity. Uh, we've got a couple of blogs about it as well and uh, a couple of YouTube things, but let me, um, let me can this and I can show you one of these in action. This. So this is uh, what I'm about to show you is basically taking the GitHub iModel Unity example. It's fully self-contained. You don't need to do anything special with it. Uh, basically, uh, just download it and uh, and run away, and it'll go. And I'm not sure where I stuck. Yeah. Yep. 
be passed from Visual Studio Code. Um, the example, beautiful. So it's a, a two-part app. So there's a, a node-based application and a, um, a Unity-based app. So I'm just going to open up the, uh, the node-based app first. The app itself is pretty simple. It just uses a offline demo.bim file here. That's part of the, the source application. So it's not actually pulling it out of the, the web session. Uh, so all completely offline here. And uh, I won't take you through the code. But uh, let's just get that one up and running. All right. On the Unity side, we also provide a Unity project to go with that, uh, which receives that or initiates and or connects to and initiates that stream from here. While I get Unity fired up, is anyone doing anything like this? Uh, currently, are they are you taking information out to Unity, Unreal? Anybody, anybody at all? If you're doing, or if you're, or if you're interested in working on that, let me know. We can work on that. Definitely. Okay, so this is. Uh, the Unity editor, normally you'd have a bunch of scenes down here that would go through, but this is the the, the sample. Again, it, it's simplified in, in all degrees, and basically by hitting play here to actually run that, uh, that game, uh, you'll see it'll make a connection. Now, it's a bit hard to do on a single screen, but I'll try and jump back and forth a bit. Uh, you'll see here that there's requests coming in uh, over the net uh, to this app that's running in the background, and it's serving up this eye model uh, into Unity. One of the, the benefits of, of running this tooling and why we did the sample was the connection of the business keys comes across. So when you click on something in uh, Unity here, even though it's a bit hard to see because it's off the top of the screen, uh, the actual ID of that object uh, is presented to you. So if you're using your iTwin as your source of data and you're using Unity as the visualization presentation layer, uh, you can still pull that information out of your iTwin and present that to your end user in Unity, uh, whether that's you know Hololens or some sort of VR application in there as well. So it um, it's uh, quite performant. You'll see it'll actually stream in parts of the model as we move around. I'll try and the outside here. So sample model, you can of course replace this sample with your sample that you can create with uh, the iTwin snapshot tool. And I'm definitely no good at gaming without a, uh, a controller, so my apologies for my poor mouse skills inside games here. But all that information that is in iTwin comes across uh, in here as well, and it's ready to go. Now, Omniverse is similar. Unfortunately, because we're a public company, I uh, can't give you too much on uh, what we're doing in Omniverse, uh, besides what's been uh, spoken about by NVIDIA and, and by Bentley. Uh, but basically, we're doing uh, something similar for Omniverse. If you haven't delved into Omniverse, it's uh, pretty awesome. Uh, it's sort of next level on top of Unreal. Uh, I think, but uh, that's just a personal opinion. And they've got lots and lots of of different uh, machine parts, if you like, within uh, Omniverse. So the ability to take your 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 eye model across, rather than having to remodel it in Omniverse, uh, just makes life so much simple. And in there, they have uh, really cool physics engines that uh, that you can do awesome stuff with. But unfortunately, at the moment, that's all I can say about that. But there will be a connector coming for for Omniverse uh, soon. We've got it in trial with some clients in Australia. Uh, if so, if you're working for those and you've, you've probably seen it, um, uh, you'll know that it, it's pretty good stuff. Does does water really well, I love it. It's fantastic. And as a short summary, that's uh, that's probably all I've got for iTwins out to other 
uh, visualization tooling. So if anyone's using Unity, Omniverse, or Unreal and, and wants to ask some questions or have a chat about it, that's uh, now would be the time. All right, failing that, uh, we have got uh, probably half an hour left. I think we were originally scheduled to finish in QA at uh, about two. Uh, so if there's anything that anyone wants me to delve into or take a look at, uh, I'm more than willing to, to do that as well. <clears throat> I know the crowd is small, but I thought smaller crowd would be much more interactive. So anyone has any question, please. Let me put that uh, locations back up on the screen here. And I'll pop that one into the chat. So what are we after this one? Right, so if you want to mess with Uni, Uni is the easiest one because we give it to you as a full sample uh, and you can get going in about 10 minutes if you download and run it yourself. Hmm. Is anyone else using Unity Tree? Is it um, Cheryl uh, Griffith using? Uh, no, um, out of my day, in fact, uh, it's uh, Dr. Moist over there. Hold on. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Moist and his team, the, the, the whole event is sponsored by Center for industrial AI research and innovation. And they are, in fact, they, there is going to be a workshop or a, or a boot camp on Unity tool next week. So oh. they are working extensively on Unity and that's the, it has not gone to the student level yet. We are still working on the program. So uh, we are trying to still still frame it up, but then CIA or I, I will, I will possibly put a link link to that for you to look at it so that you get to understand what it is uh, on the ch chat box. There's a huge uh, interest on bringing in unity uh, and, and then, you know, into our digital twin because they have clearly, clearly accepted saying that uh, Bentley digital twin, night twin platform is the way way to go when it comes to digital twin, but then making them work along. So I'm putting it on the chat box there. Yeah, I, you get it there. So they are a Unity partner. Unity is one of the one of the funding partner for the CIA lab. And like we are we are we are providing our our tools and uh, there. So there would be projects. So this is the first step we wanted to <clears throat> take towards familiarizing and creating comfort and create a, you know, creating a visibility to iTwin, iTwin platform through this workshop, though the participation could have been slightly better, maybe the, the holiday period, but um, the recorded version will reach to all those, your recorded talk will reach to all those 70 students, and then I'm sure at least a good number of them will look at it and come back again. So, so idea to create that and then later on work towards uh, actually working on a kind of a hackathon on Unity and then iTwin platform so that they, they jump onto it and they start creating, uh, you know, connect the APIs and start working on. So that's the direction. Right now, I think the most matured organization to use Unity would be uh, would be CIA, CIA or, I, or MIT, and I'm, I'm keen to throw anything that is needed, any kind of resources that are needed to take that to the next level. Ron. And uh, Unreal Griffith, Griffith has got a, a, law, a professor from Cambridge. She used to work on Unreal before on Synchro. Yeah. Synchro, uh, there are a couple of projects we are talking about there where, uh, you know, it's in a talk stage. So again, iTwin, iTwin and then connecting to Untwin. So these are the two targets I'm looking for right now, uh, much uh, in a scale of maturity. I think um, Aromati is slightly higher than Griffith right now on making iTunes talk to a external tool like Unity or, or 
Unreal Lot, one of them. Nice. Do it make sense? Yep, yep. And and of course, Microsoft's got some good uh, Unity tutorials. So if you're looking at doing AR or HoloLens, yeah, uh, they've yep. got fantastic into Unity and then into HoloLens style apps uh, tutorials. It's it's great. One one of the one of the deputy directors of CIA ARI is an ex Microsoft, a lady called Rita Arigo. Uh, she brings in a fair bit of uh, goodwill from. Microsoft into this uh, CIARA. So it's CIARA, CIARA is a place to look for in the next three, four years time because Microsoft is in, Unity is in, uh, Bentley i twin is in. So we kind of now, we're all walking around the perimeter to find out where do we take a jump in and then take a deep dive in. Yep. And, and of course, part of our openness means that you know we we don't push one way or the other. So if you want to use Unity, Unreal, or Omniverse, we we don't mind. It's uh, yep, we, yep, we yep. need to support all of them. Doctor Mostafat, did I did I put it across right? If Doctor Mostafat is online, that's fine. Uh, one of these days, Ron, I will I will connect with you, connect you with uh, Dr. John Tangaraj, who's the director for research on CIARA. Um, and possibly we'll talk about the next step I want to do a real hackathon there. Okay. Four or five days hackathon, give them the iTunes platform to the students. I, that's one of the reasons why I was very keen on Dr. French Young working on because hackathon has to have a team of programmers and the subject matter civil engineers working together. Yep. Um, working on trying to get a familiarity onto that, and, uh, and the the only thing I need to find out is how do I cr pull the crowd in. So <laughs> let me work. Let me work on that. Uh, that's fair. Yeah, and and from the Bentley side, we prefer our hackathons a bit bit structured. So if you if you've yep. definitely got a target, uh, we can we can help you achieve that. Yep. Thanks, Matt. All right, I, uh, I haven't got anything else, Sri, unless uh, someone wants to discuss anything in particular or I, uh, I'm all done. Thanks, Ron, appreciate that. Uh, anybody's got any question at all, please feel free to open up now. And Ron, if you can also give your, uh, if you can possibly, if I can request you to leave your email detail to the participants so that uh, the, you know, they have any questions later, or they have any pro, any any kind of discussion to be done with you. I would, if if it is all right with you, they will reach out to you through email. Definitely, yep. Happy to receive those those chats. Thank you. Feel free, all of you. Just feel free, and the as I told you, the, I mean, uh, anything to do with iTwin platform as as a tool, as a as a you know programmable tool, the level of expertise what Ron brings across is, uh, you know, you won't get it anywhere in Asia Pacific now. Uh, and you saw how kind he is, um, you know, how forthcoming he is. So, uh, anytime, anything, feel free to reach out to him. I can promise you he'll answer back depending on the level of pressure of commercial work, what he has. So, um, we will look forward to that. And Irfan, don't worry. Um, thanks for that, Matt. Uh, when I visit uh, Queensland next time, um, we we will we will grab a coffee with Ron together. So we have to look at the N79 to be seriously developed on Irfan. So I will work. We will work with Ron on that. Just going to leave that on the screen. If everyone uh, wants to know more and you want to self-learn, uh, the developer course is fantastic. Beautiful. I think it's time for all of us to say a huge thanks to Ron for investing his uh, two days of work, two days of work on this. Ron, uh, this is definitely the first phase met. Uh, we will create more momentum and more this, this thing towards academic academia. So uh, the part only academia. I mean, the only way to develop this product is through working through the academy as well. So um, look forward to your support on that. So thank you, Ron. Truly, truly appreciate and. Thank you all participants for for your time and uh, you know for your attendance here and uh, thank you dr mostafa for for the opportunity provided to us we truly and then if we can pass it on to 
Dr. Professor John as well will be in. I will also write to him. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Yuri. Thanks for organizing this and all the effort. Uh, I think that was very useful. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Doc. I think we we may have to possibly get together and discuss, find out about how do we. Because there's a great opportunity. It is not about I'm hurt that there is not many people attended. I'm only hurt because there is, this is a great opportunity for many people to know about the product and get on. So maybe you, me, and John have to get together to find out how do you make it on. Maybe possibly one of those lecture period of time. I can have Ron taking them through this for about two or three hours as a guest lecture. But let's talk about that, Dr. Mustafa. Thank you yeah, for that. Sure, sure, yeah. And uh, uh, my own team members, um, Adil and um, and so on. Thank you so much, guys. I mean, I know again you have to get up early in the, in the morning today, but maybe make that a habit and to get up early in the morning and take a good walk in the morning. Uh, you guys are in, guys. So <laughs> I was kidding. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate that. And thank you all. And we will meet again. I twin, I twin is not going away, and I'm not letting you go away. So I will come back to you all with an I twin program again. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks, Ron. Uh,